Greetings and welcome to all of our guests and panelists from around the globe today. Um, we're delighted to be presenting today's webinar, The Ukrainian Economy in 2020 and Beyond. I'm Kathy Nalavaiko, president of the Ukrainian Institute of America, and we're delighted to be co-hosting this webinar with the Shevchenko Scientific Society. Um, <clears throat> we have often collaborated with the Shevchenko Scientific Society um, on a number of meaningful programs, and this is just another one of those efforts. Um, for those of you who may not be familiar with the Ukrainian Institute, we are a not-for-profit 501c3 organization that is dedicated to preserving and promoting the art, culture, history, uh, and everything associated with Ukraine and Ukrainians globally. Uh, we are we have moved many of our programs as most not-for-profits have and most organizations have to an online format, uh, which has given us the opportunity to really expand our reach and to work with professionals and individuals that we might not otherwise have been able to do if we were working in uh, a physical format. So the virtual format has actually allowed us to, uh, to do uh, many things and to uh, pursue initiatives that were otherwise not available to us. Um, <clears throat> both the Ukrainian Institute and the Shevchenko Society uh, really uh, are only able to uh, produce these types of programs uh, based on donations and the contributions of our donors. So um, you will see throughout the program today uh, that there will be an opportunity for you to donate. Uh, we hope that if you enjoy the program, you open up your hearts and your wallets and support us and uh, future programming. So without further ado, um, it gives me great pleasure to introduce Dr. Helena Hden, who is the president of the Shevchenko Scientific Society, um, and she will give us an overview of the program today and of our panelists. Helena? Thank you very much. Uh, on, the, on behalf of the Shevchenko Society in the United States, I would like to say how pleased we are to be among the sponsors of this virtual event. Uh, I'll say a few words on the society. The Shevchenko Society is a scholarly organization with roots back to 1873, when it was first founded in Lviv with the financial backing of prominent families from central Ukraine as part of an effort to circumvent the ban on nation building activities in the Russian Empire and to channel the intellectual resources of Ukrainians, both in the Eastern and Western lands. Its uh, most important members, uh, Mikhailo Hushevsky, Ivan Frankov, Volodymyr Hnatyuk, laid the scholarly foundations for research that eventuated in hundreds of monographs you know, on, in, on the full spectrum of academic pursuit. In the United States, the society was reestablished by post-World War II refugees in 1948 and now comprises several hundred members uh, in five sections, philology, history and social sciences, the arts, medicine and biology, physical and applied sciences. It is headquartered in New York City. Uh, more than seven years ago, Ukraine chose its direction away from Russia and towards the European Union. Since then, a part of the political class of Ukraine supported by civil society and international organizations has been trying to develop the strong institutions required to achieve this goal. The progress that has been made so far allowed Ukraine to preserve macroeconomic stability uh, and um, despite the COVID related crisis. Our speakers today represent the very best of these efforts and I'm so pleased that we um, have them with us. Uh, our webinar is titled very broadly as the Ukrainian economy in 2020 and beyond but will specifically address the impact of the COVID pandemic, which seems to be reaching its peak and portends a very difficult winter. Uh, our distinguished panel are among the best experts and they are affiliated with the Ukrainian think tank Vox Ukraine and the Kyiv School of Economics. I would like to also take a moment to uh, acknowledge the coordinating committee for, uh, to aid Ukraine uh, who were the initiators of this event. Uh, the panel will discuss the lessons of economic policies worth worldwide to counter the pandemic, the policy choices made by Ukraine, measures taken, measures not taken, measures not to be taken, 
their outcomes and Ukraine's overall um, prospects for the future. Uh, Timothy Milovanov is the president of the Kiev School of Economics, where he has worked to raise the standard and profile of that institution. And if I may digress for a moment to congratulate the school on the opening of their new building in downtown Kiev, it is indeed um, very impressive. He is professor of economics at the University of Pittsburgh and in 2019-2020 served as Minister of Economic Development, Trade and Agriculture in Ukraine. His research interests include game theory, contract theory and institutional design. He is a co-founder of Vox Ukraine. Yuri Horodnichenko is the Quantish professor, uh, prof presidential professor at the Department of Economics, University of California, Berkeley. He is a prolific researcher and author of works in the field of monetary policy, fiscal policy, taxation, economic growth and business cycles. He serves as editor of the Journal of Monetary Economics and sits on many editorial boards, has received numerous awards for his research and teaching. Uh, indeed, the institution Research Papers in Economics has ranked him as the top young economist in the world. He is also a co-founder of Vox Ukraine, and I cannot but mention that he is also a member of the Shevchenko Scientific Society. Darina Marchak is head of the Kiev School of Economics Center for Analysis of Public Finance and Public Governance and an operational director of Prozora Sales, which we have read so much about. Previously, she worked for the World Bank, the reanimation package of reform, and was an advisor to the Minister of the Cabinet of Ukraine. In 2014-2015, she worked in the Ministry of Finance of Ukraine. And finally, our moderator today has served, um, Ilona Solohu, has served as the CEO of Vox Ukraine since 2019. Previously, she was the Director for Policy Research at the Kyiv School of Economics. Ilona has, ex uh, has experience in preparing analytics on various topics related to economic and social development. As I mentioned, she will moderate this panel and I would now like to pass this session over into her capable hands. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, I'm glad to see everyone here. Uh, I would like to tell a few words about PC and Vox Ukraine. Uh, the Kiev School of Economics was founded in 1996 uh, by a number of international organizations, and we here uh, actually all the graduates of this institution. Uh, it provides uh, the best economic education in Ukraine. And uh, uh, while it started with the MA in economics, now it has uh, three MA programs and an MBA program, and uh, also a number of short term programs and, of course, the research. Uh, Vox Ukraine was also founded by the graduates of KC, and uh, the main purpose of this organization is to raise the level of economic discussion in Ukraine and to provide some uh, modern economic knowledge to Ukrainians. I will now pass the word to Yuri Nichenko, who will talk about the impact of COVID on the world economy. Thank you very much for having me. It's a great pleasure to be a part of this event. And I must say I have an impossible task. I need to summarize the effect of COVID-19 crisis on the global economy in just three slides in a little bit of time. Um, so I will try to uh, focus on what I call key stylized facts about COVID so we all understand what is, what is happening and what we should expect uh, to happen in the near future uh, at the global scale. The first fact I want to emphasize is that as we were entering 2020, nobody expected COVID. You look at the professional forecasts prepared by the IMF or other professional forecasters, and was supposed to be a standard, in many ways, boring year. For example, you look at the left panel blue bars. This was the projection of the IMF for the growth rate of GDP for advanced economies, for emerging economies in Asia, emerging economies in Europe, and so on. And you can see that this 
Blue bars are all positive. They're all suggesting that the economy is going to expand at a healthy rate and this uh, growth is going to be uh, broad-based. Now we have COVID uh, and uh, all the scoring costs are not relevant anymore. So nobody anticipated this. So that's the first fact, you know, it was supposed to be a, a good year, a normal year. It turned out to be something completely different. Number two, uh, we see that in the midst of the crisis, we realize that the economic contraction is going to be huge. You look at the uh, yellow bars uh, in the left panel. This was the forecast prepared by the IMF in April 2020 in the heat of the crisis. And what you should see here when you compare this yellow bars relative to the blue bars is that there is a huge decrease in the projections for economic growth. For example, for advanced economies, the projection was that we're going to expect on roughly 2%. During the crisis, forecasts were minus 6%. So in a way, you have like a forecast error of 8% negative, right? So you have growth, which is 8% lower than what we anticipated at the beginning of the year. So this is a very, very big shock, you know, something we have not seen in a long, long time. And uh, another important element here to keep in mind is that when you look at the distribution of these yellow bars, is that they are almost all negative. The only exception is emerging and developing Asia, which is basically China. And the reason why it's important is because typically when we have a global crisis, global recessions, we call them global but they're not uniformly distributed across countries. You always have some bright spots, some areas of growth. For example, you look at the uh, Great Recession, global financial crisis. It was a global crisis, but we had China expanding, India expanding. In general, developing countries were growing at you know, lower rate, but they were growing. Now, what we see here in this uh, figure on the left with yellow bars is that we see enormous synchronization we see economic contraction everywhere. It's not like you know we have a part of the world which is not affected. And this is very unusual. This is very unusual. This is a truly global show. This is the second fact. The third fact I want to emphasize is that we're going to have a recovery. Look at the right panel and the green bars uh, next year. So the IMF and other professional uh, forecasters project that we'll have a strong expansion next year. So we will have control over, hopefully, over the spread of the virus. Uh, the shutdowns are not going to be here with us anymore. And economic activity is going to resume and we'll have strong economic growth. For example, you look at the developed countries, uh, we expect the green bar shows roughly 4% uh, growth of GDP uh, in this region. Now, so this is great. You know, we're going to have a recovery. But when you compare the size of the uh, green bars relative to the yellow bars, we see that the green bars are smaller in absolute value than yellow bars. What this means is that we're going to have a recovery, but this recovery is not going to be enough uh, to catch up to the level of output we had before the crisis. So we'll have a recovery, but it's not going to put us back on track where we used to be. This means that this recession, this crisis is going to have a scarring effect. It will take years, you know, more than one year, two years, three years. Uh, there is a lot of disagreement on how much time it's going to take. But in general, it will not be a complete recovery next year. We, we have to wait uh, until uh, we catch up uh, to the pre-crisis levels. And this is the third fact, that we're going to have the scarring effect. We are going to have to live with the consequences of the COVID-19 crisis uh, for quite some time. It's not going to be over next year. Next slide, please. The fourth fact I want to emphasize here is that uh, we, we learn from the mistakes of the past. For example, during the global financial crisis and the Great Recession, the governments were very slow in employing fiscal and monetary policy, especially fiscal policy, to help the economy survive the crisis. This time, the countries, the governments, were relatively fast in mobilizing resources and trying to support the economy through monetary policy tools and through fiscal policy tools. So this was great. But one implication of this uh, active policy uh, response is that the level of uh, government debt, public debt, increased dramatically, especially in advanced economies. You look at the right panel and compare the blue bars for advanced economy and uh, uh, the yellow bar uh, for advanced economy. And you can see that 
the debt to GDP ratio increased by 20 uh, percentage points. That's a very large number. This is probably something you would see when these countries are in a war, like in you know, World War I, World War II. We have not seen something like this in a very long time. But in a way, COVID-19 is, is like a war. We have to throw resources to contain the crisis and have uh, to support the people and businesses to survive through the storm. But the magnitudes are very, very significant. And so what will happen going forward for us is, is going to be important how we're going to deal with this uh, public debt. So we accumulated a lot of debt. Uh, it's not necessarily a bad thing. We should be doing this when we have an economy in crisis. We have to support businesses and people. But there is a cost to this. And this cost will be with us for quite some time. Next slide, please. Next slide. Uh, so I'll start talking about the next slide. Uh, one uh, thing which is going to be true uh, is that we have a, an elevated level of public debt now. And uh, the projections are suggesting that we are going to continue to have this elevated levels of public debt for quite some time. So when you look at the projections at uh, what the level of public debt, thank you, level of public debt is going to be in roughly four or five years from now, you will see that we have roughly the same levels. So what this means is that governments uh, appear to not have active plans to reduce the level of debt. Now, this is not necessarily bad, but it creates a risk that next time we're going to have a recession, we will not have fiscal and monetary policy ammunition to fight this recession. So we're going to be in a vulnerable position. Now, I understand that many governments uh, appreciate the significance of these vulnerabilities and they will revise their plans uh, towards some type of fiscal adjustment. And this may be uh, a mix of policies. It may be uh, reductions in, in, in government spending. It may be increases in taxes. Um, I don't know what mix will be used by uh, each specific government. But it's conceivable we will see increase in personal income taxes, especially for high income households. We will see some strong enforcement of uh, tax laws. Uh, we will see uh, some fight against uh, tax avoidance and tax evasion. Probably we'll see increase in corporate taxes, maybe increase in value of the taxes, some type of value, uh, some type of uh, uh, you know, increase in tax rates is likely to happen. So, we know that's uh, a problem. Um, we know they make us more vulnerable. So far, it doesn't seem like the problem is going to be resolved. But I think there will be a growing appreciation that the government has to somehow adjust to, to this reality. There will be some fiscal adjustment. And so we should not anticipate major government sp uh, spending programs in, in the near future just because the levels of uh, public debt are, are so high. That's my stylized fact number five. I'll stop here. Thank you, Yuri. I will uh, take up from here, and I can also, uh, I will ask, uh, ask uh, everyone if you have questions. You can write them in the chat, and we will address them uh, afterwards. Um, on this slide, you see the uh, measures that were implemented by many governments in the world to support businesses, households. Um, their economies, and you see that Ukraine implemented practically all of these measures. These green peaks are the measures that Ukraine used. And um, but, uh, obviously, we could use them at a lower scale than, uh, for example, advanced economies. Uh, Ukrainian total package amount to something like 2.4% of GDP, while, for example, Germany uh, used like 12% of GDP and uh, other advanced economies, uh, of course, have more fiscal space to do, uh, to support um, the business and household. Uh, so here I present the uh, social distancing measures and economic support measures that were introduced by Ukrainian government. Uh, we had a complete lockdown in March until in mid-May, approximately, 
and uh, now the schools and kindergartens are open, but the universities study online. And uh, recently, about two weeks ago, Ukrainian government tried to introduce uh, what they call quarantine, but uh, right now it is, it is cancelled and there is a discussion whether uh, we should introduce uh, some complete lockdown or partial lockdown again. Um, uh, right now, just the large scale event are prohibited and of course uh, there is masks and, and so on, other protective measures. Um, as for the economic part, uh, there were some tax relief uh, during the lockdown. For example, labor tax was cancelled for two months, property tax cancelled for one month, and there were a, del a delay of uh, tax inspections and fines if uh, an enterprise didn't uh, manage to pay taxes in time. Uh, no uh, penalties were applied. There were some subsidies for business and for uh, entrepreneurs uh, with uh, children under 10. Uh, there is the program of subsidized loans on the part of the government and uh, about 80% of this uh, program is issued to refinance existing loans, uh, which is uh, good support for the firms who don't have to um, bear this uh, Expenses when their revenues uh, have fallen. Um, there is some support to healthcare workers and insurance to those healthcare workers who uh, suffer from COVID, uh, but they are quitting hospitals. And anyway, and the monetary policy was uh, quite loose during this uh, lockdown to support the economy, and there were some. Uh, loosening of banking regulation also to provide some space for banks to accommodate, for example, loans of enterprises who were in distress. Uh, some of the measures used, to, uh, used under the so-called anti-crisis measures are not uh, can be uh, potentially dangerous. For example, this is um, Simplified procurement when all the tenders were cancelled, uh, the cancellation of competition for the government positions, and cap on the uh, payment to, on the salaries uh, to the supervisory board members of state owned enterprises uh, that could uh, reverse the reform of this corporate governance of these enterprises. And uh, my colleague Darina will talk more about the fiscal measures. Thank you very much, Alon. I think uh, th thank you for inviting me for this uh, um, discussion. And uh, taking uh, from here, I would like to talk uh, a bit about the fiscal response of the government uh, uh, of Ukraine for the COVID crisis. In April, uh, the uh, amendments to the state budget uh, were made by the Verkhovna Rada, by the parliament. Uh, and uh, these amendments uh, have made uh, like uh, major changes both to expenditures and revenue sides of the budget. Revenues uh, decreased by 6.8%, uh, while expenditures in, uh, increased by 7.5%. And uh, thus, uh, deficit uh, increased threefold from 2.4 uh, to 7.5% uh, percent of GDP, or around $11 billion. And uh, this is the biggest uh, deficit uh, for the last six years uh, since 2015. Uh, actual deficit will be lower uh, since Ukraine is, uh, was not able to raise over 4 billion of planned financing and now lacks this uh, money to finance the deficit and thus uh, part of expenditures. So we expect that uh, the uh, actual deficit will be about five, uh, maximum 5.5% uh, of GDP. Uh, but at the time when the budget was uh, amended, 
uh, Ukraine was in uh, discussions with the IMF and cited the new IMF program um, linked to a number of major, very important reforms for Ukraine, such as land reform, banking law. And this helped us to receive the first tranche of the new IMF loan uh, in June. Uh, 2020, and this tranche amounted to $2.1 uh, $2 billion. Um, as well, Ukraine had a number of uh, successful placements on the international markets and raised uh, $4 billion uh, in euro bonds uh, in, ge in January and July. Next slide, please, Ilona. Uh, the major change of the budget was not uh, like deficit itself, but the creation of the COVID fund. Uh, the COVID fund is not something like know-how of Ukraine. Uh, more than 40, co uh, 40 countries around the world has created, have create, uh, created such funds this year. Uh, although there are some changes between the way this cre uh, these funds uh, uh, work in Ukraine and in other countries, because in many countries, so these funds were not budgetary, but uh, uh, extra budgetary, and they were aimed to um, put together all the private invest investments, uh, international donor funding uh, available to counter the COVID crisis. In Ukraine, it was rather a one unallocated uh, line of budget expenditures, also, one of the biggest lines, uh, it amounted to 5% of uh, total expenditures planned uh, in the new budget, uh, or $2.3 billion of uh, unallocated expenditures. Uh, the goal of this uh, COVID fund was to finance medical uh, expenditures, mostly uh, to help uh, uh, to make social payments, uh, to uh, help those people who are affected by the job losses uh, because of the COVID crisis and so on. Next slide, Alona. Thank you. And here you can see uh, the total amount of those money uh, put into the COVID fund. As of now, uh, uh, some about 1.5 billion uh, dollars are allocated through this fund. Of them, uh, we have the major lines, uh, uh, social support, uh, roads, uh, and health healthcare. Uh, roads uh, were funded as a part of the effort to uh, stimulate economy during the COVID crisis and thus to help uh, like creating job places and so on. Uh, as of now, only 65% of the COVID fund are actually spent, although all 100% uh, of the money are allocated uh, between the uh, governmental bodies, executive bodies. Uh, but uh, as Ilona has just told, uh, Ukraine is planning, government is planning to introduce the new lockdown uh, in the coming weeks. And the president has uh, introduced three draft laws uh, uh, in the, on the 1st of uh, December to promote, uh, to help uh, those people who will be affected uh, by the lockdown again. So uh, there are big changes, uh, chances that uh, the government will spend all 100% of this COVID fund. And uh, it's important also to notice that Ukraine has such kind of fund uh, in 2009 during the global financial crisis. It was not COVID uh, fund, it was a stabilization fund. Uh, and uh, as of now, although there are a lot of uh, like problems and uh, questions to the efficiency of the COVID fund uh, itself, uh, still uh, there are reasons to say that this experience is much more uh, um, uh, successful than we had in 2009 with the stabilization fund. Uh, there are also another of other public funds spent through the budget uh, to 
to uh, help uh, uh, economy and people uh, during the COVID crisis, uh, amounting to one uh, uh, one point six billion dollars. Uh, most of them, this is support to, to pensioners. Elsa. Uh, about uh, 1.5, oh, uh, 0.5 billion uh, tax allowances uh, to entrepreneurs, and also subsidized loans and loan guarantees. Uh, so, in general, uh, it's important to note that Ukraine's spending as the share of GDP uh, is uh, uh, at par with Bulgaria, Moldova, Albania, uh, and uh, uh, total uh, support planned for the COVID uh, expenditures uh, amounts to 2.0% uh, of GDP. I will stop here. Um, hi. So, um, I'm Timofey Milovanov. I am also serve, um, so I serve as the president of Kiev School of Economics, but also serve now as an advisor to the uh, head of the presidential administration of the office of the president. So I'm uh, somewhat restricted in my ability to speak uh, about a number of issues, but essentially I support everything which has been said before. Um, the uh, prime minister should be, I think the government and the prime minister soon will uh, kind of announce uh, the um, programs while well, some of the programs are announced for lockdown are current in um, support and also there might be some information about when and uh, how it will take place. Um, as a minister, I've worked on um, some of the major reforms in 2020. Um, it was low on the land market, low on geo data, uh, low on derivatives, um, um, development of the stock market. Uh, then uh, IPR protection also was in our um, portfolio. Healthcare reform, hospital district centralized procurement agency, some of it was in our portfolio, some of it was in uh, the Ministry of Health. Um, a number of improvements in the international trade, uh, reducing of the barriers and uh, a number of improvements in the uh, in the banking regulation that was not uh, my portfolio specifically but this is what has been done uh, currently um, we also cannot comment on this but uh, ukraine is in the middle of negotiations with the imf the most recent news uh, was released i think last week by the minister of finance saying that um, the budget parameters have been approved or have been coordinated with the imf so there's some progress in that uh, over this fall, there is a major step back institutional court decision on anti-corruption infrastructure, but there are actually several of them. One was on NABU, National Anti-Corruption Bureau, and the other one on asset declaration, uh, on e-declaration. And so that now presents a major challenge and there should be a, uh, a way forward to restore. So new legislation will have to be passed and uh, it has become obvious that the constitutional court uh, is actually not acting well, you know, I'm not in a position to make that call, but uh, a lot of observers are worried about um, whether the constitutional court itself is a problem. Um, yeah, can we move to the next slide or we can go over the... the, the... This is it. That's, that's it. Okay, so I'm, I'm going to talk a little bit about the political constraints. Things are taking much longer than one would have liked in Ukraine, partly because the um, the... Um, all of the major parties, except the leading party, the power party, the the government um, sort of this uh, servant of the people party, all of them um, in maybe one or two more like Batkivshina, but others are interested in a crisis or in continuing crisis because that uh, allows them um, allows them to increase their uh, standing in the next parliament. So there's now a number of parties which are. Um, you know, would be potentially interested in the snap elections in the parliament. So that creates some dysfunctionality in the parliament. Um, there is, of course, a challenge, and it was obvious to finish the uh, 
financial year for the government, but uh, it appears to be under control. So it's not easy. We need to watch the risks there. But the Minister of Finance is probably, you know, as uh, I think there was a discussion a little bit earlier, the liquidity in the system is present. The macroeconomic, uh, the inflation is low, macroeconomic stability is there. So if uh, no major mistakes are made, um, then I think the end of the year will be fine. We should uh, continue and finish the, um, you know, IMF uh, or kind of get to the next tranche. But again, since we're in the midst of, midst of the negotiations, I'm not commenting on the details. Um, on this. Um, the major constraint is um, the, you know, sort of the curse of Ukraine. Um, the continuous infighting among different political actors uh, who all, uh, who all are, um, you know, trying to get, uh, to increase their standing and ability to control um, the agenda in Ukraine. I recently watched an interview of Nemtsov when he was considering, uh, comparing Ukraine and Russia it's an old interview, and I think uh, his comparison is really, really uh, describes what is happening in Ukraine right now. He basically said that, you know, Russia is like a major semi, you know, heavy truck moving really fast. There is one person in control at the driver's wheel. Everything is, is really going well. The only problem is that they are driving on ice, and this ice uh, becoming thinner or thicker depending on the price of oil. While Ukraine is a much smaller truck, uh, moving in some kind of, you know, um, dirt road uh, in the spring where there are three drivers trying to get a hold of the wheel and, you know, people are trying to hold to the truck so they don't fall off, but it's moving in the direction of Europe and the road is leading only in that direction and sometimes it's moving faster, sometimes it's slower. I think it's a very good analogy or metaphor and, uh, you know, probably we don't always move as fast as we would have liked. Uh, but here at the Kiev School of Economics, you know, or at Vox Ukraine or elsewhere, we're trying to, you know, we're preach uh, a constructive approach and trying to make things move forward as much as possible. Again, I think the macroeconomic uh, situation is more or less stable. Uh, there is a question about the timing of lockdown and the recovery in the next year. Uh, the negotiations with the IMF are ongoing. We will see uh, when they will lead to fruition and uh, we should be moving with structural reforms that's a little bit slower than let's say i subjectively i would have liked thank you uh, we have a few questions that were sent to us in advance uh, before this seminar <clears throat> and the first question i will address to timothy uh, since you were uh, involved in the labor market reform, when you were, were a minister, could you please comment on the role of labor unions in Ukraine? Uh, the first part is whether they can help uh, break up the uh, oligarchs' control of the country, and second, whether labor unions, uh, unions can help support the strong civil society and, as a result, a resilient and equitable economy. Okay, so the question is about labor unions. I was pushing for labor market reform, including labor code liberalization. Uh, I had, of course, skirmishes with labor unions. Um, um, there are, you know, we cannot, uh, there are, if I were to simplify really, 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 I would say there are two types of labor unions. One is sort of, you know, the, um, they are more established, they are bigger, they are more powerful, they are, some of their rights are codified, um, including, for example, simple things, um, uh, that they some labor unions have authority or right to be present at the cabinet minister uh, meetings or uh, but others don't so those more powerful they tend to be in my view captured by oligarchs themselves so they are in no way any kind of counterbalance force then there are new emerging a little bit younger labor unions those are um, what you would call true labor unions and those can be relied upon uh, to try to balance things out and uh, improve. So, you know, it's not uh, black and white. They're really kind of uh, labor unions which control a lot of uh, property um, that they inherited. Actually, they didn't inherit the rights, but they inherited the ability to control it. And um, those labor unions are, you know, feeding some of the political rents, in fact, because there's some corruption there. Uh, but then there is a new emerging labor unions, which are a positive force in my view. 
Thank you. The next question was about uh, the rise in social inequality in Ukraine, and I will take that myself. Uh, the question was whether it can harm the investment climate in Ukraine. Well, first of all, the inequality in Ukraine, at least according to the official World Bank data, is rather low. It was like 20, the Gini coefficient was like 26 in 2018. And for comparison in the US, it's 41. Uh, and uh, I, in my view, the inequality is much less harmful to the West climate than uh, the state of judiciary of Ukraine and uh, the corruption, which are two major constraints usually named by investors. Um, I address my next question to Yuri. Ukraine has a large inflow of remittances from labor migrants, about 8% of GDP in 2019. And according to the IOM survey, 40% uh, of remittances are used for living expenses, 20% investment uh, invested mostly into housing, and the rest is saved. Uh, can remittances be used to develop Ukraine's education and healthcare in your view? And what does economic research tell about this? Thank you. It's a great question. I would say, again, to keep it concise uh, in terms of several facts. First is that there are deniable benefits from remittances. They help in terms of macroeconomic stability, cash flow in terms of foreign currency and so on. So it's number one. Number two, Ukraine is a part of the global trend where remittances are now bigger than foreign direct investment or official aid to emerging economies. And uh, <clears throat> Uh, and uh, in developing economy. So Ukraine is a part of this trend. Number three is unlike FDI, foreign direct investment and official aid, remittances are extremely decentralized. And this is what makes control and use of them uh, much more difficult, much more challenges because, challenging because people use a variety of channels to uh, remit the money. It's very hard to aggregate this remittances into something which can be funded uh, uh, can be used for funding a big project. And, and finally, uh, you know, the research, uh, at least for developing countries, shows that you can set up uh, programs, uh, for example, matching grants, where uh, we can establish a program uh, with, you know, a dollar of remittance to uh, Ukraine may be matched by a dollar of uh, public funding to do you know, something useful for the country, such as education or healthcare. And finally, we should be funding education and healthcare uh, in any case using public money, because there is a very strong case uh, for these programs. Uh, there are enormous externalities from having a healthier population, from more educated population, and we shouldn't rely just on remittances to fund public education and healthcare. That's all. Thank you. And uh, the next question, the final question that was sent to us is, uh, I address it to Darina. Is Ukrainian government communicating its policy well to the Ukrainian public and the international community? And which areas have been most successful? Uh, thank you for the question. Uh, I think that the major point is that for the last uh, uh, year and a half, uh, and a half. Uh, the government has changed greatly its approach to the communications. Uh, and now it's not uh, the communication based on the like uh, steady explanation of why some particular reform is important and why it should be done. But rather it is the communication is focused on the uh, opinion polls and uh, uh, attempts of the government uh, to uh, to say something that uh, 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 population wants to hear according to the opinion polls. Uh, and that is why uh, this creates, uh, this uh, leads to like uh, uh, positive and negative uh, effect. Uh, on the one hand, uh, we see the uh, very, big uh, support uh, for the president uh, still uh, regardless like um, covid crisis and a lot of problems in the uh, in the communication sphere but on another hand we see 
uh, some misunderstanding of the government's policy, both from the expert society and from the international community. Uh, and uh, I think that uh, uh, for those uh, reforms that are uh, communicated well, uh, we can uh, name Privat, uh, privatization, and this is one of the major success of the uh, current government and previous government, just because uh, privatization was always a nightmare for all politicians, but now it is like very popular and supported uh, by the polls. Thank you, Karina, and uh, I will uh, ask you again to comment on one of the questions in the chat, which is related to COVID-19 vaccines. Uh, what is the Ukrainian government doing about that? Uh, Ukrainian government is planning uh, to spend uh, yeah. around uh, $60 million next year to uh, buy these vaccines and to uh, to make vaccines for the population, it will not be enough to fund uh, all the needs. Uh, uh, and probably, if we have these uh, vaccines available, it will be possible to redistribute re uh, state funds to buy more vaccines. Uh, as of the procedures, I saw there were questions about the procedure of spending this uh, money. Uh, there are particular procedures for uh, medical spendings, but uh, on my mind, it's uh, too early uh, right now to speak about these procedures because uh, they will be uh, like approved uh, next year or already when the government, when the state budget is approved and the, when the particular budget program is approved as well and all the documents are ready. Uh, thank you. There is one question about the brain drain. Uh, recent years have seen young people leaving Ukraine. Are they for studies or for professional opportunities? Are there public and private sector initiatives to address this issue? And what can be done to retain talent individuals? Uh, I will probably ask both Timothy and Yuri to comment on this. I'll probably start, you know, as somebody who <laughs> left Ukraine, um, uh, <laughs> I'm a part of <laughs> brain drain, but I don't think it's a bad thing because, for example, I as a professor in Berkeley try to recruit Ukrainian students, uh, come here, get education, and then if not, return to Ukraine and help the country directly, maybe stay in Ukraine, uh, I'm sorry, stay uh, in the West, uh, train a new generation of students and uh, help Ukraine indirectly through Kiev School of Economics uh, through uh, Works Ukraine through other organizations. So this is not necessarily a bad thing. It's number one. Number two, I think you know if Ukraine wants to be a part of the West, we have to accept the fact that people have to have freedom. They have to move across countries. They have to drive better lives. And if we want to integrate with the rest of the world, uh, we have to allow people to travel to get education elsewhere. And, uh, you know, as people travel and see how the world operates, some of them at least, uh, will return to Ukraine and will understand that we can have a better life, a different life, and we have to work hard. And this is part, you know, why we have a new generation of people in Ukraine who are interested in modernizing the country because they have seen how the rest of the world is operating. They know life can be better. But it is their responsibility. It is in their hands. Change the country for better. Yeah, I will add to this. I also can um, represent, or I represent a person who moved to the West to get education and I uh, spent some time in different countries, not only the United States, but also Europe, uh, in Germany, I work. And then since 2014, similarly to Yuri, to Ilona or to Daria, I have been involved um, in developing Ukraine through building institutions, through training students, through improving uh, or helping to improve communication and policy. So uh, it's, not, um, it's not a black and white, it's not zero sum. It's not zero or one. You're not, you know, in many, many of Ukrainians uh, keep very uh, strong connections um, 
if, even if they move uh, to the West. But some come back or, you know, like me, um, they spent most of the time in Ukraine uh, relative. And then um, these people who are very well educated, they become, you know, they, they have credibility, they have their independent, um, their incentives or their motivation is not questioned. They're not corrupt. Um, they have, uh, um, you know, built their careers elsewhere. And I think this is very helpful to move Ukraine forward. On the other hand, there are also improving um, educational opportunities in, in Ukraine. So many of people, uh, many of young people now can take dual programs or, you know, even in Kiev School of Economics or Ukrainian Catholic University or, or Kiev Mahila Academy, we have very modern, you know, extremely competitive programs, which are, you know, uh, Eastern European level. And some of them place people in, in top place, including ours, of course, but also Kiev Mahila, uh, Ukrainian Catholic. They, they have faculty from the West or they place people later in graduate programs. Um, or even in industry in the West. And finally, there are business opportunities for Ukrainians now. Those, you know, I wish they were available to me 20 years ago, 17 or in whenever I left Ukraine. Um, now, you know, you can build analytical companies, you can enter IT, you can do advanced technology, you can actually have unicorns, you can build startups and sell them later. These opportunities are here. One of the, uh, you know, very successful product IT companies is Genesis. Uh, operating both in the U.S. and, you know, elsewhere in Africa and in Asia, they are fully present. All their stuff is in Ukraine. And some of our graduates of Kiev School of Economics, they have become co-owners, uh, co-shareholders, or and also CEOs of these companies and uh, of the companies Genesis invests into. So the opportunities present in Ukraine to, the, to be a member of the global community, especially in business. In academia, it's a little bit more difficult. So you do have to get your PhD elsewhere, but you still can be connected. So I think uh, uh, things are improving, really improving. It, it took 30 years and will take another 30, but you know, the country is moving where you know, it, it should be. Yeah. Timothy and Darina will uh, take the question on IT. What is the state of IT technology sector in Ukraine in 2020 and prospects for the future? Me or Timothy? Okay. You go ahead first. Okay. I can start uh, with a short remark that uh, IT is one of the most flourishing Ukrainian uh, economic sectors. Uh, it counts uh, to about four point of GDP and it, uh, its growth rate is about like uh, 20 to 30 uh, percent per year. Uh, it is uh, also one of the most uh, like successful from the uh, 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 Okay, sorry, uh, I didn't find the English proper English world immediately, but um, I would like also to comment from the government point of view for a long period of time for three decades uh, uh, digital uh, digitalization and IT sector were uh, of the agenda of Ukrainian governments and for the last uh, a year and a half we have the uh, great progress here because now we have not like just uh, uh, general statements about the support for the IT without any particular particular deeds, but we see the uh, uh, strategy and we see the progress of digitalization of the government itself. Uh, itself uh, for the last year, we have, for example, such things like uh, Dia. Uh, uh, this is application uh, where every person can make a huge amount of uh, different operations with the government uh, for which previously you had to go to some like uh, state offices and stay and stay in terms and in terms. And uh, now DIA uh, and Ministry of Digitalization are one of the flagmans uh, uh, supporting economy, in particular IT sector. They are trying to build uh, uh, like long-term uh, tax, uh, tax support system for the IT sector. We do not know if this will be a successful exercise or not, uh, but they are doing a lot in this regard. All right, I'm going to add just I'm going to follow up uh, or kind of reinforce this IT sector is booming and I wouldn't just call it, you know, it's kind of um, 
you know, its top um, management and IT computer science are the most popular um, currently majors that people are applying to. Um, by the way, that's why we're going to be opening bachelor program for the Kiev School of Economics, not only in business and economics, but in IT, because the market is forcing us to move there. But let me give you an example um, from the government. So we're talking about COVID program, support program for people who will be temporarily unemployed. And this is a new program, and I discussed it with the, um, it was the vice prime minister for digital transformation that is indeed based on this DIA application that the ministry has developed and this is uh, spearheaded by the president but you know the think of Ukrainian government it's you know post-Soviet Union bureaucratic not very efficient machine so this is the idea how the, the direct transfers should be used or can be used um, basically everyone who is affected by COVID and uh, is in the industry, you cannot be anyone, you can, you have to be in the industry affected by the restrictions on COVID. Let's say if the government introduces lockdown and your, you, your industry is affected, then what happens? You as a person, you go on your smartphone, on your computer to portal, on your smartphone, you're going to go into an app. You log in into your app automatically. And then in this app, you just type in the name or the code of your company and your account number. That's it. And then the system will verify who you are, whether you are qualified, whether you are, tar you know, within all the criteria needed. And within several day days after this is verified, you will get a direct transfer to your account. So you basically, you know, in terms of customer experience, it's two click experience. You type in your company, and you type in the code of your company and you type in um, and you type in the account where you want to get money and within several days you get paid so you know it's fantastic even for developed countries i don't think it's possible we still send in checks in some countries um, while in ukraine you know this is the progress that the bureaucratic machine has done so there are good things in ukraine there are bad things obviously um, there are tons of challenges and they will continue to be there but it is the way to go it's booming and if just another remark, uh, I'm also the uh, operational uh, director for IT, a state IT company, Prozora Sales. And what we are doing is to provide, to digitalize, uh, digitalize all the selling uh, procedures of uh, uh, state and uh, municipal property. And for example, only for the last uh, year, we have reformed uh, together with the government a number of sectors, for example, like the uh, all the lease uh, uh, agreements uh, made for the state, the com communal and, and uh, mun municipal property. And this is a huge reform because you never had any possibility to know about some particular lease uh, possibilities uh, in any city. And now all the information is online, uh, centralized, and any particular person in Ukraine can go and rent any building uh, from some, uh, some state uh, enterprise. Thank you. Yuri has answered the question on Ukraine's economic prospects in the chat. And does, does anyone want to add anything to that? Uh, I suppose that we should focus on attracting MPIs. Uh, there is also a question on cryptocurrency adoption, development, and regulation in Ukraine. Uh, would anyone like to take this question? Well, the fact that the cryptocurrency is being circulated and used by some businesses, you can donate, let's say, to the fund uh, Tabletashki, one of the biggest funds in Ukraine supporting healthcare. Uh, using cryptocurrency and the central bank and the security services of uh, Ukraine, SBU, they are involved in the discussion what can be done. Um, and, you know, I, as, as recently as last week, I talked to the governor of the National Bank of Ukraine about this. So, you know, there are, of course, obvious risks and trade-offs. Uh, but, yeah, the government is not shying away. Uh, however, at this point, um, there hasn't been made a decision of how we deal with cryptocurrency and what's our approach. Well, I think, Timothy, you could continue about the land reform legislation. Uh, when do you think the land market can start functioning as it should? 
I think there are a couple of questions. There's a question, you know, in the chat, one about breadbasket of Ukraine, Ukraine being breadbasket for Europe or for the, uh, you know, at least for the regionally. And the second one is uh, about land market. When does it start functioning properly? You know, markets are not built in, in a day. Um, the next date, which is important, is... Uh, um, is um, in July of this year, of 2021, when the first um, stage of the market, land market reform is going to be introduced. Uh, but we need to build infrastructure before that. So hopefully all the infrastructure is in place. There are still some challenges. For example, there was a law on 2194, one of the auxiliary laws on the land market reform, which was not passed today. Uh, by the parliament, or excuse me, yesterday, because of some, uh, you know, 2400 amendments, as it's, <laughs> it's typical in Ukraine to, we don't have a filibuster, but we have uh, amendments filibuster. Um, so there are challenges. Uh, but uh, going back to the breadbasket question, um, in fact, um, this is one of the few, if not the only industry, which is currently, uh, has reached the levels of the Soviet Union pre pre uh, you know, break up of the or collapse of the Soviet Union and actually outperformed. However, there has been a substitution in that industry that um, a lot of um, kind of animal, a lot of farming, animal uh, meat production uh, has been cut down, especially when it comes to the beef production. Uh, but it has been substituted by grain production. Uh, in terms of uh, volume and uh, you know kind of value added and also in terms of pol uh, and also by poultry so the this is one of the few industries which has recovered from the transition from the cry you know continuous or recurrent crises and is doing better than you know some years ago and it's growing so it's a it's already a great industry but it is expected to grow further Okay, there are still many questions, but I think uh, we will need to uh, complete this uh, session. Thank you for being so active. Uh, Darina told us that she will answer the question about uh, defense procurement in the chat. And there is the question about foreign markets. Uh, I will briefly tell that uh, Ukraine has been developing its cooperation with the EU uh, quite successfully in the last uh, six, seven years. And uh, of course, the big potential is the markets of Asia and Africa. Okay. So uh, I'm ready to give the floor to either Helena or, or Olena. Um, th thank you very much uh, to all of our panelists uh, for such a, a insightful uh, hour and uh, giving us so much important and uh, great information about Ukraine and its economy and its prospects for the future. Um, Helena, is there anything that you wanted to add? You're on mute. Hang on, you have to unmute yourself. Sorry, lack of experience. Uh, I just wanted to thank all the panelists and commend them for all of the wonderful work that they're doing for Ukraine and for, you know, for move, moving, moving our leaky ship forward. So thank you all again. And I hope that we can continue our cooperation. Yes, we look forward to seeing all of you back. And in the meantime, uh, wishing all of you and everyone in our audience um, safe and wonderful holidays. Everybody be healthy, be safe, and we look forward to seeing you again sometime soon. Thank you very much.